uh, being a representative to that organization put me in contact with architects from all over North and South America. Um, <clears throat> but it also corresponds, and, and in 2003, I uh, was elevated to the College of Fellows. I want to mention the Code of Ethics, and we'll come back to that in a second. In 2004-2008, I was... Uh, I became the president of the Pan American Federation of Architects, which, which, me, which put me in touch with folks at the Union International of Architects. So we go from the orange that goes like this to the whole global organization. The Union International of Architects, think of it as the United Nations. Uh, it's an association of associations on a global level. And uh, being involved with those folks, uh, we're working on a number of things having to do with the environment, with protocols for the practice of architecture, very important uh, activities that help us uh, elevate the standards of architecture at the global level. I see some of them in the audience today, so it's very good to see uh, uh, my friends here. This also uh, led to, in 2011, when they were putting the, the jury together, that the UIA was one of the contributors to the seven jurors that were going to be on the international, on this committee. And so, in 2011, I was appointed to the to the Olympic Master Plan selection jury, and uh, of course, you heard that right now I serve as your national treasurer. I'm very honored to do so. We've had a good period, by the way, but it's not a financial report right now. I'll do that tomorrow morning. This is the judging panel that I got to serve with, and I'm telling you, these are wonderful folks. Uh, John Baker from Australia. Uh, he was involved in the Sydney Olympics. Uh, wonderful fellow, uh, George Wilhelm from Brazil. Uh, he's respected in the entire country of Brazil and Latin America. Uh, he was appointed from the federal government. Uh, I'm sorry, the first appointments were uh, from the organizing committee. So John Baker and Gustavo, Gustavo Rosas was an alternate, I believe. And let me clarify. We had seven judges, but we had uh, ten because we had three alternates. So uh, I was a little wonder. I was wondering what that meant. If in case one of us became incapacitated or something, what was going to happen? My backup was over here, uh, Christos Curtis. Uh, he's from Greece. He was involved in the Athens Olympics, and uh, you'll see me there. I'm, I skipped over the uh, our hosts, which is the IAB, the Instituto de Arquitectos of Brazil which is like the AIA, Instituto de Arquitectos. And then also, very important, our hosts is on the far right side slide is uh, Sergio Diaz from Brazil. And he was appointed, and both of them were appointed, him and his alternate from the municipal, and there's there were municipal, federal, and state government appointees for, uh, for, for the whole process. Uh, Rio also is a state. I think Brazil has 27 states. So Rio is a city as well as a municipality as well as a state. And those that are keeping me honest, make sure that I got my facts right on that one. Um, <clears throat> flew in on a uh, overnight and uh, arrived after a nine or 10 hour flight. And uh, they took us uh, to a dinner where we met everybody. And then they said, okay, you guys are going to have to get to work tomorrow morning. Took us on a helicopter over the site, and we get into a uh, room, a large jury room, probably about a third of this room here, maybe just a little narrower, full of boxes of stuff. And uh, these boxes had CDs, uh, which contained videos of the entries, uh, large, draw large format drawings, uh, books, and... Uh, financial information and a uh, number of things that responded to the entries. We had 60 entries from 18 countries, and you can see the breakdowns right there. But I know some of you may have been attracted to be here because Rio is beaches, right? Before I went to, before my experience, uh, this is what attracted, this is what uh, I knew about Rio. You know, I'd heard of, this This one is, for example, Coca Copa Cabana. And, uh, I uh, spent a little bit of time because I, I felt it's interesting to orient everybody that these paving patterns mean something. On the left, we have Copacabana, which is a kind of a wavy, swirly pattern. And it's not always the same. Sometimes the wavelength is longer, shorter, but 
in that district, the wavelength, the wavy pattern is Copacabana. And it actually originates from a por Portuguese tradition in which paving patterns are done in different areas. In Oro Preto, it's different. In Belo Horizonte, it's different. In uh, uh, Sao Paulo, they have different, uh, different paving patterns. And so that one's Copacabana. Ipanema, <clears throat> and I'm sorry about this. Ipanema on the right is kind of this interlocking uh, pattern that also has that positive negative thing going on. And uh, it became, of course, more famous in the 50s and 60s. Uh, how many people have heard the song, The Girl from Ipanema? <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, but those are not the only two paving patterns, but th this is what I know, uh, you know, this is what I know Rio de Janeiro for. Um, Christ the Redeemer statue that's on top of the uh, top of the Corcovado mountain. And it's looking towards the east, towards the bay. And by the way, Rio is river. Janeiro would be January. And we'll get to that in a second. It's not, a, not much of a river there. It's more of a bay. <laughs> but uh, Christ the Redeemer statue looks out towards the east. And then towards his right hand would be Copacabana, Ipanema beaches would be there, of course, is right. To the left would be the original port of Rio de Janeiro. And then, of course, uh, we're talking about uh, the samba music and carnival and everything related to Mardi Gras. Now, those of you who know about uh, New Orleans and other things, I mean, Rio, this is a almost a, a year-round <laughs> preparation for about a 10-day uh, event and uh, this photo is actually taken in the samba drone and uh, they literally call it that the samba drone because if the hippodrome is where they have horses samba is where they have samba and this was designed by Oscar Niemeyer who designed dozens of uh, famous buildings and the samba drone is basically a long processional area with with bleachers on either side where uh, where all types of groups and, and uh, organizations compete to basically party the best, you know, to, to have the best uh, dancing and, and uh, costumes and color and everything, the more the better. But if you exceed 81, 80 minutes, then you're done. You know, so Rio is also known for the favelas. And I want to talk about that also because there's a social aspect to this. And if we believe that architecture can do something to interact socially with the rest of the environment. There's also something here on this one. So I'm giving you some fun things and some serious matters to consider that, uh, that we all had uh, were factors that we considered in the master plan process. Favelas generally are higher than the better parts of the city. Not always, there's many exceptions, but in general, because the city as it developed had all the utilities and bus lines and infrastructure and sewer lines, which are really important for, for sanitation. But the favelas would just climb the mountains without sewer lines. And then later on, they would string power up there. They can get cell phone reception and other things, but the sewer lines didn't make it up those hills. And so they're, uh, it's a tough place, and that's where some of the unrest has, has happened, and we'll talk about uh, some of those factors uh, as we go along. <laughs> I attended a, uh, a wine tasting, and I wanted to taste the wine, but they started telling me about the history of the grapes and how the grapes taste different depending on where the grapes came from, and I became a little frustrated. So I don't want anyone to get frustrated if you're like me, you want to get to the Olympic master plan. <laughs> but I think it's important to set the stage that Rio is really a port. It was, uh, uh, and Rio, January, um, I'm sorry, Haneiro being January, it was uh, uh, discovered or uh, founded in, by the Portuguese in the 1500s. As it grew, it was always a port where both uh, immigrants came, slaves came through there, but uh, more importantly, gold was exported through there from the state north of Rio, which is Minas Gerais. 
they had been finding mineral after mineral after mineral in the state. Minas Gerais just means general mines would be probably the closest translation. Can you imagine having a state called general mines? Uh, could, what if California after the gold rush of 19, 1849 had been renamed general mines? You know, it would be kind of weird, right? But uh, but uh, general mines is very appropriate because Minas Gerais is a, an area very rich in all types of minerals. And when they found gold, it just went nuts. It, I mean, a lot of growth occurred. And they used to export, uh, take the gold back to Portugal through other ports, but Rio was the closest one, and Rio grew as a port. And here's an early cable car for, for the tourists. And that's a shot of a much more recent Rio de Janeiro today. So now let's, let's talk about the Olympics. I think I've given you some background, some background on the port of Rio and why it's important. Uh, South America, if you think about it as a market, it's a uh, very dynamic market. Uh, but even more, uh, these numbers towards the bottom left of the screen, you know, my cursor sometimes disappears on me. I'm sorry about that. These numbers, I think, are important because when you're talking about 180 million people that are under the age of 18 in South America and 65 million of them are in Brazil, you're talking about uh, an environment and a market that is dynamic and growing. It has a number of implications. Also, the Olympic Games, uh, we're talking about 10,000, more than 10,000 athletes, 28 Olympic sports that will be handled in a short period of time. The, this is directly from the IOC website. Where they're talking, there's a lot of discussion about trying to keep the price of the tickets low. So I'm going to pause here and say some of the unrest that has happened in the past week or two in, in Rio is related to the bus fares going up by an equivalent of 40 to 60 American cents. But that's enough for the students, the favelas and others to get together and organize and I'm sure you've seen that there's been some problems there recently. <clears throat> so the website spends some time talking about making the tickets accessible. Many of the events under $20, uh, $20 US but I also know that from experience what's going to happen is the ones you really want to go to are going to be brutally expensive because there's a limit to the number of seats. For simple things like in the center, there's a kind of a brief illustration there of the Maracana Stadium. The Maracana Stadium exists already, but the seating is like benches mostly, or has been. Now it's been renovated. The renovations reduce the seat count because we need to provide ADA access. We need to have wider aisles for fire safety and public safety. Uh, and and the, the definitions for the uh, wheelchair areas and other things have, have reduced the seat count. But it's the same stadium. It just got uh, opened about a month ago. And they're reusing it for the, uh, or they're using it, they've been using it, and they're going to use it for the 2014 World Cup. And I understand there's already been games that have been occurring there in the past month. But because the seat count went down, that's why I think demand keeps going up, but the seat count went down. Uh, it might be tough to find a $20 ticket there. So I'm just lifting up just some random uh, facts that come from the uh, from the Olympic website. Uh, it's a 75 uh, hectare site. Uh, we There's some discussion about the, uh, the distance that the athletes need to travel and how much time they're in traffic. There's been some famous or maybe not so famous cases where athletes are caught in traffic to some Olympic event and they can't get there because, you know, um, and they have to either reschedule or cancel or forfeit, and it's been really unfortunate. So we don't want to have that in Rio. Um, also food, you know, one of the things that my firm does, uh, we worked at the San Antonio airport, and so we have a little bit of background on both security and food service. And uh, so sometimes uh, we would discuss, I'm talking about as a jury as a whole, about the different master plans how they provided access for food service, security was really important, uh, how far away are the hotels and other things. And we're, we're going to get into some terms like the front of house, back of house, you know, things that are very important to keep. We also talked about the environment. Um, 
they're planting millions of th trees right here towards the middle of the page. Three million trees will be planted in strategic areas between, uh, I guess that would be 2009 and 2016. That's a lot of trees. The goal is to be, be carbon neutral. They're not gonna quite make it, but they're gonna, but it's a good goal and they're, they've done many, many, many things towards those goals. I don't wanna overplay the layout of Rio, but I think it's important for people to have a sense of where we are. Uh, up here towards the uh, top, you'll see the airport in the downtown area, the historic port area. And this is why we didn't really think of Rio as a international beach destination because they didn't really go to the beach until Copacabana down here. Uh, the Copacabana Palace was built in the mid 20s. And that's because before that it was basically a working port. And the, also the other thing is the, the concept of leisure time is fairly recent. <laughs> Even though it's been around since the 1920s, uh, this is a working town, uh, a hard working town. And uh, the idea of spending the day at the beach uh, at least enough to be having hotels and stuff didn't really happen until the 20s, 30s. And Copacabana is a very interesting district. You've seen one or two shots already, not just the wavy sidewalks, but also you can see the Art Deco architecture marching down the street. And there's one house left from the 1890s. They haven't torn it down yet, but it, those preservationists out there, there's some work to do there because I think it's going to get torn down. But the, in, in addition to the Art Deco architecture, it also kind of marches into the 30s, 40s, 50s. And uh, you can see it marching as it heads out towards the ocean. And then it kind of turns the corner here and becomes Ipanema. And that's more of the 60s and 70s and uh, looks very modern. But this city has continued to grow and Barra is where the Olympic site is gonna be. Out here, this beach, Barra, and I'm aware that in Portuguese it's Baja, right? But uh, Barra is uh, almost like, a, they literally call it a mini Miami because you go from seeing stuff in Portuguese to stuff in English out here. And uh, they have a number of American franchises are, are located out there. Uh, but also it's a very robust growing area and that the uh, triangular site that it's in the center of this red dot here is where the site is. It's a former racetrack that the municipal government owned. Each of these circles is where they have different Olympic venues. Downtown, there's a number of things that are happening there. The canoe uh, and uh, other, uh, the, yeah, kayak races and other things are happening in the Copacabana, Ipanema area. I think there's golf and uh, racing and other things happening in the Deodoro area. And Barra is uh, where we're gonna focus our attention. This is a list of the of the activities that'll be in the, the site that we, that I was on the jury for. Basketball, cycling, drive, uh, diving, field hockey, gymnastics, handball, judo, taekwondo, tennis, water polo, and wrestling. And also uh, there's uh, discussion about all the transportation linkages between these events and others. Oh, and I forgot to mention that it's not just the Rio Olympics, but it's also the Paralympics that'll happen shortly after that. So here's, a, here's the site. We were given a large manual of, of information to read. I'm proud to tell you that I read most of it. And, uh, and so arriving there, I felt that I had been looking at this site for months, even though I basically had two, reads to, two weeks to read the manual. Triangular site with a setback here for uh, some uh, military installation. On the north side, there's a major avenue it's a racetrack that is owned by the municipal government. This lagoon is very important. And then there's a favela that cropped up along here that kind of encroached on some mid middle class housing that is right along the shoreline here. And these are all important factors when we're looking at the site. How are we doing on time? For the benefit of the online audience, the question is how were the other sites developed or existing or whatnot? Maracana Stadium is existing. 
there's a, there, I'm not aware that there's a master plan jury or anything like that for the lagoon and the kayak racing. I'm not aware that they're doing anything like that. I think they just said, we're going to do this and, and here's where we need to do it. And I don't know what they're doing in Del Dodo either. So I'm prepared to talk about Barra. <laughs> But I needed to repeat the question for the benefit of our online audience. I really would like to be moving around, but I, hello. <laughs> so, so, did that answer your question, sir? Yes, okay. And um, with all due respect, that's why I'd like to gather the questions maybe towards the end so that we can also have some online uh, 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 questions. But I also appreciate the interest, so thanks for the question. Um, See, oh, I needed to talk about the favela because it's a factor and also the different master plans reacted differently to the favelas. Uh, and, and it's an important part of the jury process because not all the jurors are exactly the same. Remember, some of us are from the Olymp International Olympic Committee or the UIA or the IAB, which is the AIA from Brazil, or the municipal or federal government. So each of them have different... Uh, concepts or ideas on the interaction. I took this picture from the helicopter when they took us over, and you can see the, the pollution from the favela. As architects, we want to look at the beautiful things, but we also need to respond to the, to the human needs. And this is directly because of sewage being dumped directly into that lagoon from the favela. And then you can see in the uh, upper left part, you can see that these originally were middle-class houses, but they are backing up to a lagoon with a pretty miserable water quality. So we have some other givens. You can see the rest race track here, and there's a couple of arenas and facilities already there. Up on the upper right, there's a swimming facility that exists. There's an arena here. I understand that uh, Artists like uh, Avril Lavigne and Ludacris and others have performed here. And uh, there's also another uh, facility that is here that these will all be used for uh, the Olympics. Directly from the IOC website, you can see that the construction is already occurring and they're already starting to take out the racetrack. I think that was only about a month ago that we took that picture. Another thing to keep in mind is that the London Olympics had not happened in 2011. So when I was on the jury, London was still being planned and worked on. And there was a tremendous emphasis on the legacy of London, of the events. Not just Elton John singing and all that, but also, you know, how the, the facilities, all that investment in the infrastructure, all the investment in security. Remember, we were worried about security in, in London also. So all of that uh, infrastructure, is it doing uh, a social good? Is it doing, uh, and especially from the perspective of the, of the Brazilian government, when you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, are we doing a social good? And are we doing a social good where we need to do it? And are we doing it in the best way possible? Is it leaving a positive uh, legacy? So these were factors. I mean, looking back, London's in our past. But at the time that I was on the jury, it was in our future. And so that those were all factors. We also were aware of a number of these facilities that had occurred over the many years that uh, were either abandoned or underused. I understand that this pool, for example, is now on the list to be renovated in Berlin. But some of these, literally nothing has happened there for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. The online audience should be able to see these. So uh, now some of these are not from abandonment. You know, uh, Sarajevo had uh, violence occurring there. And uh, but uh, and I understand that this is uh, a graveyard in Sarajevo. But even Beijing in 2011 is in our recent memory, and we were aware that some buildings by design were temporary, 
but then the plans go awry or they change or whatever. Uh, and we didn't want to have a legacy that was anything but improvement. In other words, if you're not taking a step forward, at least you're not taking a step backward. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the baseball fields that are now being integrated to a shopping center that's next to the basketball arena. But, you know, you probably remember the iconic uh, buildings like the Bird's Nest and the Water Cube and others. And uh, some of you can probably check online what, what their condition is or what happened uh, there. These were all factors that, that we were keeping in mind as I was on the jury. <laughs> So um, let me go into the specific criteria that, remember I, I mentioned that they gave me a big manual to read, and these were the, the factors that we used to uh, consider, grade each, each uh, entry, and then start to eliminate some of those that were not, uh, I wouldn't say anyone was completely wrong, but there were some that met the criteria better than others. And since we're talking about not just one or ten criteria, but literally dozens of criteria, not, nobody had straight tens across the board. And remember, we were seven different jurors, so we all had different opinions about some of the criteria. But for example, <clears throat> the organization, uh, by the way, sorry about the terminology, FOH is front of house. So you've learned something. <laughs> if you, so front of house, back of house, that's BOH, very important differentiation especially when you consider when you have two or three million visitors, you don't want them to get too mixed up with the athletes and the security aspects of or others. There's the point where they are performing or uh, in the event where you want them to see that, but the approaches and exits are, uh, it was very important in all the master planning to keep the routes and services separated. So the, the way that the, uh, the uh, master plans operated were probably the first and foremost criteria in reducing, you can see on this slide, from 60 to 29 that were chosen to go further. I think a lot of them started to become eliminated uh, when they were uh, viewed very carefully for the operation of the Olympics. Remember, I had folks next to me that were in the Sydney Olympics, the London Olympics, the Barcelona, uh, you know, they knew exactly what it took uh, to perform, and they also knew where things had underperformed. Transportation was very important, and we'll we'll get into like the subway lines and bus rapid transit in a second. But remember, the the goal is to be as green as possible. But it's not just getting there, but also how do you move around in this very large site? Then they want to make it as walkable as possible, and uh, and still not get too mixed up with that front of house, back of house. Material transfer also has to do with uh, with uh, food service. And those of you who have food food service experience, it's bringing it in, making sure it's not too, sitting there for too long, but uh, you know under the right conditions and it's prepared, cooked or warmed up or whatever. And then the garbage has to be considered. So uh, all of the ins and outs uh, were very important factors. Security, uh, and I'm aware this is an online audience, can't talk too much about the details, but I can assure you that that also was an important factor in uh, looking at the master plans. Of course, we're gonna have a secure perimeter. These are publicly available criteria. Secure perimeter, screening areas for both visitors as well as screening areas for athletes. Uh, and then vehicles, because we have all types of vehicles that come in, it's media and other things. And then using security by design so you can see rather than uh, the effort to not just have hardened walls, but also to be able to, to see what's going on. is openness being preferred rather than hardened walls. <clears throat> the venues uh, were also looked at specifically for spectators. How do you provision them, the footprint? Uh, there were a couple entries where they had the, side, uh, the stadium sideways or something, and, uh, and we at this level, we need to have them all oriented at the at the right place. Some places, some of the entries had a very good front of house, but a poorly designed back of house approach, or vice versa. And so that that balance needed to be in, included. And then finally, we looked at the aesthetic experience. Also, there's also art and beauty, and we also considered that too. 
but I wanted to impress on everyone that the criteria, we have a ton of objective criteria to look at for these master plans. We also like them to look beautiful, you know, but the criteria was very, very important. Those of you who might attend would be reassured that all of this stuff and more is being looked at for your safety and comfort. So we're using one of the entries as an example. And remember, we're talking about games during the Olympic Games, and then later on, Legacy is another. So during the, how are we doing on time? Left or? Okay, we're doing very good. Um, so this is an example of a games mode uh, entry. Uh, it was ranked third, and they received an honorable mention. Uh, in many cases, the overall plan was well conceived. Uh, it has many of the elements of the winning uh, master plan, the approach coming in from the upper, from this major avenue. A entry plaza that, that does a number of things, leaves you room for screening, leaves you room for, uh, you know, tickets and, you know, all the activities that happen pre-entry gate, uh, and also a sorting ability so that you go through the gates and you can find where you need to go. You know, if you're looking for this stadium or that place or whatever. And it also provided a route, I'm tracing through this way, for the back of house to be able to, to come in through here or to come in through here and provide access for the athletes to the different venues, the practice facilities. Uh, I did not know that. I mean, there's a ton of practice facilities that you never see on TV. And so there, all of those, even though so many of them are temporary, it's a, a major logistics factor in the, the master plan for the Olympics. And uh, you can see that they also reuse, for example, the, the swimming pool area and some of those, uh, the arena where they have the rock concerts and some of the reuse of those facilities. The interaction with the lagoon was very important. And the interaction with the favela was another factor. And because <clears throat> we felt that this one was not as successful, I apologize if this was, if you're the author to this, but some of the comments that occurred during the jury process is that there, there might be a better way to interact with a favela than having uh, a row of trees. And uh, we, we had government and municipal officials that talked about entrepreneurial activities. Where, where the uh, Olympic site is up against, uh, you know, the favela. And are, is there a way to maybe introduce fingers of, of uh, utilities and other things to the favela? Remember, the previous responses would sometimes be to pull out the bulldozers. So this was a, a very important part of the master plan process. The lagoon also, because we want to do something to improve the water quality, and so many of the plans that probably would not be looked at at this scale. Remember, there were books and other financial information and videos that were submitted that talked about the water quality and uh, their infrastructure and uh, water treatment and a number of other things that, that were in there that may not be visible on a master plan at this scale. Let's see, But here I'm transitioning from the Olympic Games mode to the legacy mode. And so you can see that there's some thought to which buildings stay after the Olympics and which ones either are changed or demolished or and become for uh, either public use, community centers, housing, you know, medical things uh, and other things. Now, one very important driver is also creating value because the idea was even though the government, municipal government owns all of this, is to eventually return parts of this, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, back to the private sector so they can pay taxes, so they can help the government provide more services. So they, I, thought, I felt that that circle was very important to, uh, to consider being on the jury and witnessing literally government officials saying, we got to turn over some of this to the private sector so we can do more wonderful things. It's like, okay. They, they see the connection. And, uh, and so the real estate numbers for the potential square footage of housing or other things uh, was an important factor. And that was a whole other section of the criteria that we looked at. And uh, 
if you're keeping track of the lower yellow area, there, there's also, this is where uh, we're keeping track of the entries, how well they met. Well, some of them were eliminated in those previous slides because they had an imbalance of the private sector or, or uh, the numbers didn't work or uh, too, much, uh, too much of the infrastructure was getting torn up or abandoned. Those were all factors that, that were uh, occurring as we winnowed down the number of entries. Have I put anyone to sleep yet? No, not yet. Okay. Uh, just a, a couple more slides on the, on the criteria, and then we're going to get to some uh, some more stuff here. Site services are very important on the legacy side. Remember, this is not just specifically for the Olympics, but is, is there a water treatment plant? Are, are we doing what are we doing for the solid waste, and uh, how much energy is being used, and and uh, how efficient? Yes, how green can we be? It's important for us architects to remember this is at the master plan stage. We're still not talking about buildings, but we want to see what their strategy is for these items. Sewage treatment, rainwater, water retention. Transportation, we talked about the road infrastructure, the existing avenue and how it's used, how it inter interacts with public transit. Uh, the subway line that uh, right now ends in Ipanema is going to come out to Barra but it doesn't connect uh, specifically to this site, so they're going to have to use bus rapid transit. But what uh, we looked at the master plans as far as what does it do in the legacy mode there. And even parking, are, is the we still have to provide a bunch of parking because there's media and officials and athletes and, uh, and buses and things. Uh, aside from the uh, public interaction, there's also a lot of back of house parking requirements and then what happens to that parking? You know, we can have an ocean of asphalt out there. How is that used or reused? Landscape is very important, and uh, some master plans reacted to it uh, more successfully than others. Talking about reforestation along the perimeter in the lagoon, uh, talking about the natural heritage of the plants that are even there or adjacent to there, then the uh, drive to not import too many plants but to have plants that are locally available, indigenous, so there's not too much uh, as far as artificial irrigation or any of those kind of things. And then uh, we also look for public spaces, that, uh, is, and I would keep hearing the municipal and federal appointees looking for the public spaces and the social inclusion. And, as, and we, again, talk about the favela. You know, how much is the favela being inclu included, or are we building another wall over there? and the waterfront, the mountains, the vista, green corridors and views. And then accessibility uh, was very important. Some of the master plans had topographical, topographical differences, but the more successful ones minimized those differences. Still some differences, but you know, I'm from San Antonio where we have this uh, beautiful river walk, but there's lots of nooks and crannies when you create a river walk for bad guys to hang out. So. So we had to look at master plans uh, at, at things like that. So uh, are, we, are we doing the best we can to provide, provide a safe, accessible site for, uh, that is usual, universally acceptable, uh, accessible and acceptable? So, um, and so you can see if we're keeping track down here that we're narrowing down to 11 that were uh, successfully, the entries that were successfully addressing all of this criteria, I mean, I hope you're impressed like I was at how much criteria was being used to evaluate these master plans. Beauty is important, but how well did it specifically do these things? OTC stands for Olympic Training Center. You may have noticed that some of the uh, facilities that are not being demolished in legacy mode are still there. That is for the future Brazilian Olympic team to practice there. The idea is that their Olympic Training Center would be here, and we're basically building it. But the legacy is that that Olympic Training Center for Brazil would be there, you know, for the indefinite future. And so are those arenas and facilities appropriate and at the right place, the right distance? And uh, is the zoning for that make sense? Because there were some master plans that had them all scattered all over the place. Others were collected in one place. Are they spaced enough apart that they, they can work? but they still leave enough real estate for the private development and the, uh, it, the uh, 
the private sector development to increase the values on the private sector side. So that was another balancing act that some master plans did that very well and others uh, were somewhat different. And then also a balance between, uh, well, here, here's the financial viability that I was talking about, the mixed use aspect was very important. The balance between residential and commercial, there were some that were far more residential than commercial, which is okay, but you still need a certain amount of commercial. Um, and then the others that were more commercial and not too much residential, and so uh, we had differences of opinions on the importance of those. And then the construction feasibility was important. I mean, we couldn't just do these beautiful master plans, and I also had to hit specific financial targets. Uh, and again, I can't reveal some of those numbers, but there were specific criteria that had to be met there, and uh, an overall land use plan. By then, we got down to five that were, that were achieving consistently high on as much of this criteria as possible. So, uh, as we looked at those final five, uh, this is second place entry. Uh, Aquel Abrazo is the name uh, that the, the group gave themselves. Abrazo means embrace in uh, Portuguese. And uh, you can see the slide is flipping between the Olympic mode is what is showing right now, and then it, it transitions to the legacy mode. Now, this one also illustrates that uh, us architects, we wanna get into what do these buildings look like, and we kept having to tell ourselves, this is for a master plan. You know, <laughs> We're judging master plans. Eventually, uh, now they're working on the architecture, but at the time in 2011, we were not, we were just looking at the master plan. Still, nevertheless, we needed to test to see what kind of a building would fit, you know, and uh, we, so we would still look at the overall site plan, the experience for the spectators, the legacy mode, the city, is the culture and community re uh, reflected and included? Does it generate income? Is it, you know, when it's turned over to the private sector? Um, landscape is also very important, the transportation and access, and of course, the environment. And so this is the first place winner, AECOM, with, with a uh, entity called Brasil Limitada. They now have set up an office in Rio, and uh, it's in downtown Rio. Uh, went there last fall, and they, uh, they've already modified the master plan. <laughs> but, uh, but this is what we saw at, and what, was re you know, what we judged to be the highest ranked master plan. So let me go through just a couple of the features here. The interaction with the lagoon has some... Uh, hike and bike trails. We would prefer that it that the lagoon is not messed with too much, but it it uh, it's it does touch it and it, and it interact with the lagoon. But uh, we felt that this was uh, a good strategy. The uh, paseo through the middle leads you to a live site here where there's broadcasting and other events that'll happen here. We think that'll be pretty dramatic. It is not the only master plan that did it, but it's a, an important feature. Another thing is that this, the public side that kind of cuts through the middle of the site um, is fairly minimized. So you can walk through all of it rather than have to get into shuttle buses and other things. So we felt that that was, that was a good thing. We're okay on time? 39, that's good, thanks. Um, I wanna be respectful of your time, but that's all. I'm checking the numbers here. So, um, so we felt that it was important for the public to be able to participate, but not have to get into, you know, cars and buggies and trolleys and other things to get from one end to the other. So, uh, be, making it walkable was very important. Um, and we'll get into some of the specifics of the master plan. And that favela is also interacted with, but not too much. And these are the authors. This is information that was submitted to us. I am aware that considering all the tremendous work it took to do this, there probably are others, or many others that are involved, but this is the list of the uh, entry information that we have, and this is on the, on the website also. We think that it was successful because they and AECOM was involved in the London Olympics, and so we think that having that knowledge combined with the local resources uh, of Brazil Limitada uh, helped them tremendously in having a successful entry. So this is uh, not the perspective, but now you can see this 
This ratcheted area up here is the bus rapid transit drop-off areas up here. Uh, this is the bus rapid transit would tie into a subway line that is off the page here. The, uh, this is the media center and uh, a lot of communications. This is all that parking that is needed, not just for the media and the hotel, but other, uh, uh, you know, the athletes and uh, all the myriad of vendors and other things that uh, parking, on-site parking is gonna be needed, as well as a number of off-site parking. This is the favela, which we felt that under the legacy mode, uh, this entry also allowed for some entrepreneurial activities along the edge and uh, later on you'll see that there's some fingers of utilities that kind of come through there. The, their video, and I, I hope uh, you all pay close attention to the three minute video that we're gonna show, and it, it uh, also talks about the water quality and what they do with the rainwater collection and other things, so look carefully when the video is, is playing. Uh, so there's, uh, I think those are, in a nutshell, the big ideas. There's other diagrams that we'll show on subsequent slides, how they separated the public from the back of house and the access. Uh, here's where we start transitioning to the legacy mode in which one of the stadiums uh, uh, is taken out and the, that ratcheted bus area is now uh, being used uh, more efficiently because now that's a subway station of some sort and we're able to use this some of this real estate to for housing, office, and other things. And later on, it transitions here to some high density uh, condominiums and others. These little specks of color down here are very important. We also looked at, this is the segregation between the, the yellow is the, uh, inner, the Olympic Training Center facilities. So these are, oops, I need to go, how do I go backwards on this? Hmm, this one? The, uh, the training center facilities, which are in yellow, and the red ones, which are the new real estate opportunities that go to the private sector. Here you can see one of the fingers of development coming uh, through, but we would presume that that would include sewer lines and some of the other necessary services. But also, uh, it, uh, their financial model showed you know, the difference between the private sector and the public sector. And, and uh, as we go here from the uh, initial stages of legacy mode to the final stages, we, we get the higher proportion of private sector investment for this, for this parcel. Uh, and here's where it's more fully developed. And this is all straight from AECOM's uh, submittal. It, was, it, it handled and addressed that issue very successfully. Here's some high, high density condos. Uh, market value uh, would probably be pretty good, especially if you clean up the water quality in the lagoon and do other things. Uh, have some security and other venues that are very attractive uh, for that area. This slide is also important because uh, every submittal had uh, conversations about how the public comes in, and this basically took the public part. You know, how the public comes in, that there's different uh, areas of uh, flowers and uh, festivals and things that would relate to the different uh, stadiums. And so you get a different flavor for each one of these bends in this paseo. Also, uh, it, it's leading you to the live site. There's discussions about what happens there. There's discussions about the uh, native plants from Brazil, uh, which we felt was the right thing to do, and uh, and also the, the plants versus uh, plants that are seasonal. And uh, we also, uh, this diagram shows again the front of house, very well illustrated here, and basically the pink, and the back of house routes. This one, this green line shows the back of house routes and security uh, routes separated from the front of house. And uh, we thought that it did it very successfully. So watch carefully.
your strategy. quite through but that's what it takes to win an international co a competition like this um, let's see how do I get back on here let me, uh, <clears throat> let me say a couple things as we get back uh, I still need to conclude a couple things but first uh, this was a uh, transformational uh, opportunity for me. You've heard that I've been involved in the AIA for a few things, but uh, uh, it's all about serving our profession. But even more, uh, I know that I'm a better architect because of the AIA and the many opportunities that I've had. But this one was something else. <laughs> so um, got to meet uh, tremendous, tremendously talented folks. But uh, the, we're required to go through is interactive. We still have some time, and I want to give a chance to our online audience to participate. So, first, uh, here's just a couple questions. Did the AIA's code of ethics have anything to do with the jury selection? I went through that piece very quickly. Anyone remember? No? Well, yes, it did. Uh, they uh, they required complete anonymity as we were looking at the uh, at the master plans. All we had were the numbers. We didn't know who submitted what, and we were, we spent five solid days just looking at criteria. We had no idea, and preserving that anonymity was very very important. The rainwater strategy was a factor. Was incorporated in the winning submission. True or false? True. True. Security was a criterion that eliminated several entries. Yes. True. Or just shout it out. True. Yes. How many entries were eliminated for not following format instructions? C. Six. Some of these I went through very quickly. Which famous beach has the wavy pattern on its sidewalks? Copacabana. A. Copacabana. A new subway line will be built to the Olympic site by 2016. False. Oh. Sometime in the future, but not by 2016. Imported ideas and plants are included in the winning master plan. False. Imported ideas. The Maracana Stadium will be used for the World Club, uh, Cup as well as the Olympic opening ceremonies. 
think we have a couple more. Tourism is Rio's biggest industry. It's actually very important, but the port is still an important industry in Rio, even today. They found oil. Just on and uh, I think uh, the, the times I've been there, I'm usually on the plane with people that are uh, oil men from Dallas and Houston. Uh, well, I just gave you the answer to this one. <laughs> <laughs> True or false, federal and municipal governments agreed to advance a positive social legacy with this event. True. True or false, abandoned Olympic sites were a factor in developing criteria that, would, that this would not occur in Rio. True. Master plan ignored opportunities for the private sector to participate. False. Winning master plan. True. Each entry submitted a video to com communicate the highlights of their plan. False. True. True. Okay. Did we hit our learning objectives? The master plan selection process, impact on the design, long-term effects, and the transportation. Here's some resources. All of this is readily available. It'll be available online. Let me make one important final point before we vote on the questions. Look at the jury. How many women? I would like whoever you are, wherever you are in your career, because you know, I was a young Hispanic architect once. <laughs> wherever you are, the process is open. Whoever you are, wherever you are in your career, th there's tremendous opportunities out there. Start building your credentials. If you want to be on something like this, you can be there too. And that's the most important part, important part of the message that I wanted to bring to you today. I'm not saying anything against these fine gentlemen. I'm a middle-aged guy now, you know, but, uh, but um, I think there's opportunity for more diversity in important juries like this. So I'm open for questions. All right. And uh, online, we're ready for some questions. Yes, sir. We, uh, the gentleman's asking about the, the